Hello all, my name is Keith Picard from Aldo Public Schools. I teach science here and then by evening I teach biology for Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan as well. Um, today's presentation is wading into ecology using aquatic macroinvertebrates to explore stream ecosystem attributes. Uh, this will be a two-part presentation. The first part is going to be from me and uh, explaining to you how to implement this uh, in the Pennsylvania uh, regions, um, along with showing you some of the resources that you will have access to through my webpage, uh, which is also linked in with the Creek Connections webpage uh, that's uh, through Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of what I'll be referencing is from one of my publications, uh, Inquiry Lesson on Stream Ecosystems, and that can be found in the Science Scope. Uh, issue in from February 2017, volume 40, number six, and that's page 58 through 66. So first and foremost, uh, if you can get your phone out, you can uh, go ahead and scan these QR codes. Uh, the first one is to get you to my rail project webpage. On that webpage will be resources from the data sheets to lesson plans to detailed class notes for students, any and all resources in addition to links back to Creek Connections uh, web pages can be found there. Um, and then this QR code on my right um, will get you to the Rail BizStream app. I will be walking you through this Rail BizStream app. It's an app that I created um, that will essentially take any user to one they're in the stream they can identify the macroinvertebrates that they are sampling, and then once they are identified, which the app helps a user identify, it then tags that macroinvertebrate with a GPS coordinate, and then calculates the stream ecosystem attributes, as well as the hills and off biologic index to give you a number about the water quality of the stream that you're studying. I'll give you just a moment to scan those. The, web pages, the uh, Bitly web pages are down there as well. Okay, so the importance of this, the importance of this. Uh, the success of this activity lies in the joy of discovery. So in this case, we get students to actually see that in science, that the answer is not found in the back of a book. They actually have to explore, they have to collect data, they have to interpret the data, they have to present their data to an authentic audience. Those authentic audiences, which you'll see later on in the presentation, are the students presenting to you, the scientists. They're writing publications to get peer review feedback from scientists around the country and around the world in the field of aquatic entomology and stream ecology and limnology. Again, my big thing on this is to give the students an authentic audience piece. I think that is vital in any part of education. So, I got permission to use this from um, Dante Breslin. Uh, he wrote and illustrated this. Uh, just a quick little synopsis of how a leaf becomes a bird. So, how a leaf becomes a bird. A leaf falls into a stream and shredders shred it up. If you don't know what a shredder is, I'll be getting into that in just a moment. Scrapers eat the slime, or biofilm, and collectors eat the crumbs. Predators hunt their prey until one day, adults leave the stream, and the birds have their feast. So again, this story does a beautiful job of just modeling how forested streams support birds. So the big picture of what the rail project is, okay? Students collect and identify macrovertebrates to predict a stream's metabolism. Where does it get its carbon from? Is it carbon that falls in from leaf litter and woody debris, or is it in-stream carbon from your algae and aquatic vegetation? Where's the food source coming from? And furthermore, how is that food metabolized as it moves through the stream? So students, they're gonna be linking physical characteristics of macroinvertebrates with their role in a stream food web. It's big on structure and function, which is a huge component in biology as well as ecology. Collecting methods, if you're not familiar with how to sample aquatic macroinvertebrates, 
Kick netting is huge. I love using kick nets. Uh, D nets also work just as well. Uh, ideally, you just need some sort of kick net or D net. If you do not have one, you can make one with simple two dowels and then go to your local hardware store and get a nylon screen that you would put in a screen door, staple it, bada bing, bada boom. Um, so with the sampling, it's really, really simple. You just need a student to stand upstream from the net, uh, of roughly about one square meter above um, where the net is placed. They disturb the substrate. That disturbing of the substrate, there's a behavioral response of the macrovertebrate to let go, and then they allow for the current to carry them downstream to evade predation. We take advantage of that behavior by just letting them fall into the net. Once there, the students begin to sort the macroinvertebrates, sort and identify. But again, these students, they might not have a background in entomology. So again, the big component to this with the hands-on inquiry-based learning is letting them explore a little bit. So when a sample is brought in, whether you do this outside or you bring it back into the lab or back into the classroom, you let the students develop their own method of identification. Okay, so they're just going to separate them into groups. They don't need to know the taxonomy of them, but basically these invertebrates are in two groups. Here we found invertebrates with legs, these didn't have legs, so on and so forth. They're not going to be focusing on the name at this stage uh, of their observations. They're just going to basically break it into how they want to group their macroinvertebrates. After that, after they've explore that a little bit, and I've given a little bit of a background of how, ta how taxonomy works, then they learn how to then identify these macroinvertebrates. We identify them to the family level. You don't need to go super specific into genus and species. All of the functional feeding groups and the family tolerance values are based at the family level of your aquatic macroinvertebrates. Then the students are broken into expert groups. Okay, what are the expert groups? In the expert group, the student becomes the teacher, but before they can teach, they have to know what they're gonna be teaching about. So in the expert groups, unbeknownst to the students, but they are assigned one aquatic macroinvertebrate. That aquatic macroinvertebrate, each group, I'll have five groups, because guess what, there's five primary functional feeding groups, each group will have its own functional feeding groups. Again, the students will not know their functional feeding groups yet. They will just be assigned an aquatic macroinvertebrate. So once they are assigned one of their aquatic macroinvertebrates and each invertebrate will have a different functional feeding group, shredder, filtering collector, gathering collector, scraper, and predator, the students need to research it. They need to find out in their expert groups, the life hif history of the macroinvertebrates. Okay, does it have an incomplete or a complete metamorphic uh, life cycle? Uh, typical habitat, where are you going to find this macroinvertebrate? Is, are you going to find it in your pooled areas of a stream or more in the riffles? Is it found on flat rocks? Is it found in sandy substrate, etc.? Then they're going to get into the diet and primary functional feeding groups. What I hold responsible for the experts to do then is they need to create an informative poster about that particular macroinvertebrate. Here's an example of one of my students. Uh, this uh, one was um, focused on the common net spinner, your hydrocycid. So again, the habitat. Um, they did need to get this down to the family uh, level of organization, the life cycle, the food, where they're found. So again, they become the expert of the hydrocycid, the common net spinner, while at the same time, they're becoming an expert on what a, in this case, a filter feeder is. What characteristics do filter feeders have? What structures allow for them to function as a filter feeder? Or if you're a predator, what structures do you have to allow for you to function as a predator, etc. After that, I regroup all of my students into then learning crews. And in the learning crews, it's composed of an expert of each one of the 
five groups. So their learning crew will have one person that was a predator, one that was a shredder, scraper, filter and collector, gather and collector. So they're broken up into those crews and the students then need to teach their new group key characteristics about their macroinvertebrate as well as its functional feeding group. So I always lead in every day during these learning crews, again, to get the students to be thinking about diet, about diet and how that diet of a macroinvertebrate can tell you something about a stream. So a warm-up question, and in my publication, you, I have a whole litany of these warm-up questions. So what type of functional feeding group would you expect in a stream that has a lot of leaf litter? Well, four of those five groups might not know, or four of those five members in that group might not know, but, but the people that are experts in the shredder and be like, oh, we should have a lot of shredders. Hopefully then my filtering collectors and gathering collector people can then start to chime in and say, oh yeah, well, it's gonna break that down. So we should get a little bit more filtering collectors and gathering collectors, et cetera. What are my functional feeding groups? Again, I mentioned them earlier, but we're gonna go into detail on this. Uh, the macroinvertebrates, we're gonna group them in based on being a predator, a shredder, a scraper, and then the two types of collectors, your filtering collectors and your gathering collectors. What do scrapers do? Scrapers, they are found in streams and they consume your algae, your biofilms and whatnot that's growing on hard, flat surfaces. Um, they are generally herbivores. And again, these are a beautiful, beautiful example of structure and function. Here in this image is the heptagenia, the flat-headed mayfly. The flat-headed mayfly, it's essentially like this flat putty knife shaped macroinvertebrate that just ideal for sticking onto a rock and scraping off algae. Uh, your water penny, again, same structure, same structure, very, very flat so that water current doesn't wash it downstream. It's able to just hug onto the rock and be able to eat its resources, in this case, which is algae. Your shredders. Shredders, they're gonna consume your coarse particular organic matter, your leaf litter, your woody debris. Um, much of the nutrients that they actually consume, though, are actually the mold, the fungi, the diatoms and such that are found growing on those leaves, which ties into one of the attributes uh, that the students do identify. Your filtering collectors, um, they eat the leftover stuff from the shredders that's moving in the water column. These ideally have some sort of specialized body part or some sort of net. These are an excellent, excellent example of structure and function, whether it be the Simulidae, the black fly larvae. The adults, we don't like too much, they bite, but as a larvae, they have this awesome, awesome walrus-like um, appendage that stick outside of their mouth that they filter out fine particular organic matter. Or our trumpet net caddis, finger net caddis, and our common net spinner. Again, they make a net, it's ideal for filtering out fine particular organic matter. Gathering collectors. These gathering collectors eat the same thing that your filtering collectors do, except, except they don't have a structure necessarily to filter out that fine particular organic matter that's moving in the water column. Instead, these guys are more ideal for slower moving water because it allows for that fine particular organic matter because of density to settle to the bottom, to settle into the benthic layer of the stream. So that's why in these guys, they will typically inhabit low flowing areas in the streams, your pools. Get a lot of these, probably a lot of ripples. Get a lot of these, probably a lot of pools, a lot of slow moving areas. Finally, your predators. Your predators, they're gonna consume other invertebrates. Um, they're generally gonna be larger, but with that, and when you apply the 10% rule in ecology, you should have fewer predators. And there is one of the uh, stream ecosystem attributes that we will use that identifies this, and it tells us the number about what story our predators tell in regards to what sort of life cycle our prey have, whether they are selected or case selected. My students will get into that later. So now we're into our working crew. So we made it 
through our expert crews, through our learning crews, and then into the working crews. The working crews is where the students will be completing their actual rail project research. So they will be responsible for calculating those stream ecosystem attributes based on the sampling that we take. Now you could take your students out once to pull your sample. I take my students out weekly every Tuesday and then we do our data analysis on Wednesdays. Um, things to keep in mind, you've got to as a teacher discuss what the ecosystem attributes are. On my webpage you have these resources. You've got to discuss the map. Now the students are going to look at it at first and they're going to be blown away like oh my gosh I have to do math yes there's math and science and the math is pretty 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 simple it's addition and then you have to do some division for each and every one and the students also need to be familiar with the criteria ratio so once I calculate this ratio I'm going to get a number what does that number tell you again I have this on my web page and my app does it all for the students or for you as well then take the students back out to the stream once they're back out in the stream, they're going to do a complete general stream survey. That general stream survey comprises of calculating the stream discharge. It uh, comprises of them figuring out the riparian corridor. So what sort of stream coverage do I have? What sort of leaf litter do I have falling in? What is my substrate? How fast the water is moving? So on and so forth. Estimate a percent section shaded, pooled area and whatnot, because it's those abiotic factors and some of the riparian biotic factors that's going to tie into the structure and function of what's happening in the stream. So if you're not familiar with uh, stream ecosystem attributes, here they are real quickly. The autotrophy heterotrophy index in some publications it's known as the PR index which is just looking at your producers versus your respirators. This is going to identify where the carbon is coming from that's feeding our food web in the stream. Did it grow in the stream or did it fall into the stream? Now for the next one, easiest way to figure this one out, it's a CPOM FPOM index, is to think cheese and crackers, okay? I always, whenever I lecture about this, I talk about the cheese and cracker model. So if you're going to a party, are you going to eat just plain crackers or are you going to eat the crackers that have the cheese on it? Now, most of the time, especially if you're me, you're going to eat the crackers with the cheese on it. So what this next attribute that I'm going to get into is we're going to measure how long it takes to get the cheese onto the cracker, which is the CPO and FPO index. So coarse particular organic matter to fine particular organic matter. What essentially this is looking at, it identifies how quickly that coarse particular organic matter gets colonized with the mold, the bacteria, the fungus, the diatoms, the cheese that sits on the cracker, i.e. the leaf. Because what you find is not many nutrients on a leaf itself, but what a shredder wants to eat is what's growing on it. And then they just get what's left over on the leaf, like, well, when you go to that party, you don't just eat the cheese off of it and leave the cracker behind. Everyone's gonna think you're weird. The third attribute, the TFPOM, BFPOM index. It's an acronym for transported fine particular organic matter to the benthic fine particular organic matter. So once we have that coarse particular organic matter broken down into fine particular organic matter or broken down further into dissolved fine particular organic matter, we want to know is most of it moving in the water column or most of it settled to the bottom. And it's this attribute right here that ties pretty, pretty directly with what your stream discharge is, how much water is moving through the aquatic system. The fourth attribute is the substrates um, stability index or the channel stability index. Basically, what is making up our stream bed? Uh, if you're in West Michigan where we are, typically it's gonna be pretty, pretty sandy, loamy bottoms because of old Glacial Lake Chicago um, remnants of that. But in some areas, you're gonna have very, very rocky, rocky bottoms, okay? And that's going to tie into how quickly or how easily that stream channel can shift due to erosion and deposition. 
The fifth one and final one is the top-down predator control index. So with this attribute, we're looking to see if there is a balance between your prey species with a long life cycle or the prey species with a short life cycle. Your R selected versus K selected. R selected, meaning they live for a short period of time but reproduce like mad crazy fools or your K selected where they live really, really long and produce few offspring. Ideally, we want a healthy range between 0.1 to 0.2, okay, which ties into that 10% rule of ecology of when energy moves from one trophic to a level, only 10% moves on. Anything greater than 0.15 is going to indicate that most of our prey are gonna be R selected, which means we have organisms that reproduce very quickly, they have a short life cycle, but tying that into the predators, you have more resources that's gonna dictate a larger predator population. So how to measure those attributes, and again, all of this can be found on my webpage, Autotrophic Heterotrophy Index, your scrapers, who need the algae divided by shredders, gathering collectors, filter collectors, everyone who eats the organic matter that falls in. CPO methiome index, the shredders who eat the large organic matter divided by your gathering collectors and filtering collectors, the ones that eat the organic matter that falls in. PFPO and BFPOF, who eats the broken down organic matter in suspension, filtering collectors divided by who eats the organic matter that sits at the bottom, your gathering collectors. Channel stability index, who needs a hard, stable substrate? Scrapers and filtering collectors. Scrapers because that's where their food grows. Filtering collectors because they need to attach their net or attach their body onto because they have a filtering appendage to filter their food out. Divided by the ones that don't need a stable substrate, your shredders and your gathering collectors. Top-down predator control. Here we're looking at predators and we're going to assume that the predators are capable of eating every other functional feeding. Again, all of these resources are found on my webpage with pretty detailed explanations. So, the biz stream app. Quick little run through of how to use my app. And again, you can scan to get onto it right there. Uh, the first thing as it's running is you need to, I need your information, okay? And I don't share any of your information. I don't sell any of your information, but it's just so that on the back end, if I can contact you about some other water quality uh, stories happening in your uh, aquatic system. Here is an online dichotomous key I plugged in there. Once you do that, you can type in the numbers, it automatically uploads it. Just as long as you tag it with the GPS, you're good to go. If you're familiar with aquatic macroinvertebrates, I do have the autofill where you can just start typing them in right here. So in this case, Amphipoda, my favorite, and you can type in uh, however many you have. Once you have that, then I do need to ask you for some general information. It's essentially that general stream study that I have my students um, doing at the um, once we go back in. Once you do that and you hit submit, it gives you a detailed, detailed color-coded uh, report, in this case, the Hills and Biotic Index, so this report um, read as uh, fairly impacted, um, and here is my ecosystem attributes. Again, everything can be found right there. The detailed reports are there, and in fact, you can access every single report that's ever been created by this app from any aquatic system. Okay. So, on that note, I want to give you some evidence and testimony from students from other teachers. Um, because if I'm going to do something in my classroom, I want to make sure it has an impact. Here's a study uh, that I and uh, Rich Pennington, a colleague of mine out of Grand Valley State University, did uh, to see if this thing actually improves interest in the field of science and environmental sciences. And this was uh, taken from a survey of my students from 2002 on to 2020. And um, it did in fact, we did show that 91.3% of that student body, which is almost 20 years worth of students uh, responding, 
91.3% of them did agree that this did encourage them in their interest of science. Um, the next one that I was looking at is, are they interested in some sort of STEM-related career after this experience? And again, overwhelmingly, 83.3% of the students did become more interested into your STEM fields. Then, I looked at the ones that graduated from high school, okay? What sort of STEM careers are they interested in? And again, resoundingly, 82.6% of them were post-graduation interested in getting into a STEM-related field. Again, it's hardcore inquiry-based science. It gives these students that authentic science piece. Um, from one of my old student teachers way back in 2011, uh, trust me, some of these kids take this experience home and cannot stop talking about it. If you teach, I encourage you to try a project like this when you can. Uh, Alex, uh, he teaches uh, high school biology now over in the Flint area, which my Michigan map is over this way. It made news with all their lovely water quality issues uh, out that way. Uh, here's a um, recently retired teacher from Jensen Public Schools. Now, I'm not going to read you this whole thing, but I tell you, what Lori did with this, and as well as using pre-connections uh, out of Allegheny College, is her students, using the rail project and pre-connections, made big, big, big news because they were finding that the stream they were studying was getting impacted by uh, fecal coliform. And as a result of that, well, it's because of the old, old, old neighborhood that was having some septic tank issues. It made some big news and whatnot, but again, it's that authentic audience piece. It was fantastic. So, now I'm gonna lead you guys to the example of the student work. These students will be showing you what they learned doing the rail project. Hi, I'm Izzy Thorman. I'm Christian DeRocher. I'm Isabel Picard, and I'm Brayden Russell, and we are presenting a 2021 assessment of the overall health of the SEBI drain by identifying ecosystem attributes and water quality. The SEPI drain is an approximately 4,500 meter long inland first order stream that is part of the Grand River watershed in Ottawa County, Michigan. Most of the stream runs through forests and most other stretches are not covered by forests and banks covered with shrubs, bushes, and tall grasses. Uh, the, objective of the, the objective of this study is to assess the overall stream health of the SEBI drain by using the aquatic macro invertebrates to identify the stream ecosystem attributes and water quality. The ecosystem attributes we identified were the autotrophy heterotrophy index, CPOM, FPOM index, TFPOM, VFPOM index, channel stability index, top down predator control index. The final metric identified using the aquatic macro invertebrates in our sample was the water quality using the Pills and Moth Biotic Index. The abstract, Allendale Middle School students have been accomplishing the ongoing assessment of the SEBI drain in an attempt to identify its stream ecosystem attributes using aquatic invertebrate functional feeding fields. The SEBI drain is a first order stream found in Allendale, Michigan. Conclusions based off the result, the fall of 2021, show that the SEBI drain is an unstable channel heterotrophic fall winter shredder stream, shredder, shredder stream system. The majority of the FPOM was found deposited in the bed post to present, but all is derived from natural riparian and the stream processes. The SEBI drain does demonstrate the, a healthy balance between predator species and prey species with long and short lives. The alternative hypothesis was the semi drain is a slow moving, healthy heterotrophic fall slash winter stream system with an unstable, unstable channel and having an unhealthy predator to prey ratio due to an overabundance of prey. Null hypotheses. The semi drain will have poor water quality. The semi drain has been found to be an autotrophic ecosystem. The semi drain has a large organic matter, CPOM, that takes a long period of time to break down into FPOM and DFPOM. Most of this FPOM is found in suspension moving in the water and not in storage. The stream substrate is stable and not likely to erode. The top down predator control ratio is healthy and reflects the 10% rule in ecology. 
uh, method, as we get as we get the macroinvertebrates, we identify them by their fun functional feeding gill to determine the stream ecosystem attributes. To identify these attributes, we look at the ratio of given functional feeding gill dependent on a specific resource and divide it by all of the other functional feeding gill that do not depend on the given resource. These ratios can access the health of a stream by looking at all five ecosystem attributes. In addition to the five ecosystem attributes, we use the Hilsenoff Biotic Index, which is measured by adding the sum products of the, the number of individuals in each species, or general, multiplied by the tolerance of the species, divided by the total number of specimens in the sample. Results. The severed drain has been found not to be an autotrophic ecosystem, but rather as a heterotrophic ecosystem with a mean ratio of 0.0739. The severed drain is more heterotrophic the closer it is to the wood, wooded areas, which would be here and here. Uh, the severed drain has large organic matter, <coughs> CPOM, that does not take a long period of time to be processed in smaller organic matter, FPOM, which reads 46.9160. This shows that organic matter that falls in near the wooded areas is getting broken down or eaten as it moves downstream. Most FPOM is found moving in the water and not in storage with a calculated index of 0 0.7892. This is probably due to water re-entering into the semi drain downstream from where part of it is diverted into a retention pond. The stream did not show to have a stable channel with a ratio of 0 0.2417. This matches with most of the sebi drain flowing through Old Sandy Glacial Lake, Chicago deposit. Uh, the top-down predator control ratio was healthy, 0 0.146, and does reflect numbers close to the 10% rule in ecology. As we moved away from the wooden areas on campus, 403 and 404, we didn't have a change in type of prey, but rather fewer, fewer macroinvertebrates in our sample, which made any predators found there to reflect as a bigger ratio. The water quality of the semi drain, as indicated using the Hilsenoff index, show, showed with the semi drain to have a fair water quality with a calculated score of 5.19. Generally speaking, as the water enters our Illinois Public School campus, it does it does get slightly impacted by a predatory diversion of water into a retention pond. But as the water is returned back to the semi drain, the water does the water quality does recover as it moves further downstream. Based off the aquatic macroinvertebrate sample, the semi drain has been found to have fair water quality with an unstable channel, heterotrophic, fall winter shredder stream ecosystem. Most of the FPOM is found moving suspended in the water and not in storage, and top down predator control ratio was healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.